you have a huge advantage, for example, to be born into money. But it actually turns out that in the United States, anyways, if you had to choose between being born at the 95th percentile for wealth or the 95th percentile for intelligence, you'd be better off at the age of 40 if you were born at the 95th percentile for education or for intelligence. So wealth matters, but it doesn't matter as much, or hereditary wealth matters, but it doesn't matter as much as people think it matters. But that's partly because you actually can get ahead in a functional society if you're smart and hardworking. You know, if you're in a corrupt society and work just makes you into a sheep to be fleeced, well, then it's obviously better to be born rich. And so I would say the advantage to, be, to being born rich is proportional to the amount of corruption in the society. If it's a corrupt society, it's your only hope. If it isn't, it might not even necessarily be all that good for you. You know, um, what's his name? The, the best investor in the world, the richest investor in the world. His name, mm -hmm. his name escapes me. What's that? Buffett. Buffett, yeah, yeah. He's not leaving very much money to his kids. Like, it would be a lot by our standards, but by his standards, it's like, you know, the pennies in the bottom of his, in his ashtray in his car. So, and the reason he doesn't want to leave them a lot of money is because he actually thinks it deprives them of necessity, and depriving someone of necessity is not really a very good thing, because, you know, partly the reason you're motivated isn't only because you want some good things to happen, it might also be because, you know, you better watch out and get your life together or you'll get cut off at the knees, and, you know, if you're too protected, then that all goes away. And so it isn't necessarily obvious that that's for the best. So... So then you might think, well, we should have a modified Pareto distribution because that will enable people who are hyperproductive to be rewarded for it. But more importantly, if you don't have a Pareto distribution in your society, there aren't individuals who amass large pools of capital, and then it's very difficult for there to be investment taking place because some things are really expensive. So, for example, if you want to build a fabrication plant to make computer chips, you need about $4 billion. And it, it isn't really all that useful it seems to me that it wouldn't be all that useful if the only institution who ever had that much money was the government, because that would mean that the government would have to be the lead investor in everything. And that's just not tenable. You know, you're going to replace all the venture capitalists with government agents, you know, government workers. That's not going to work. So you do want there to be fairly large pools of capital. And you can also make a case that you don't want all the power centralized. And so if you take wealth away from people, I mean, high levels of wealth, what happens is, again, you start to centralize power in the government because it's the only institution that's large enough to wield a lot of clout. You know, and they say in the U.S. that most billionaires now are self-made. And so then you might think, well, if someone is capable of parceling out the crooks, there's always going to be crooks, if someone is capable of generating a billion dollars by the time they're 40, it's conceivable that that's the sort of person you want to have that much money. Because obviously they know what to do with it, right? I mean, it's easy to waste money. You can do that. I mean, I've seen people blow through $3 million in two years with no problem. Like, you can, you can distribute money if you're not careful, like, like snow melting in your hands. It's hard to keep it. It's hard to use it. It's hard to invest it properly. And it's certainly possible that you want fairly large pools of capital distributed in the society so there are multiple points of power. So... But you could still argue about exactly what sort of Pareto distribution you'd want. And there's some good demonstrations in the, in the U.S. I think I can show you that, too. That's a good one. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. 
And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. So that's the monopoly like game. did before, based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now, let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism. All the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So, here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly. But for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans, and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register they're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% owned half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee, not his lowest paid employee? See, that's the one error, I think, that's in this video. How hard you work is irrelevant in terms of how much money, or almost irrelevant in terms of how much money you generate, right? Because obviously the people who work really hard, I mean, who works hard? Those guys that are digging holes out in the road in the winter, they're, they're working hard, right? But 
you're not rewarded for the physical effort that you put in, or rarely. There's some association, but not very much. And so it isn't whether or not the CEO works 380 times harder. It's whether or not their productivity can be leveraged enough to justify that level of, of, uh, what? of compensation. Now, you can make arguments on both sides of that, and it depends a lot on the industry and on the individual and all of those things. But you don't want to reduce this argument to one of hard work. It's not appropriate. It's too unsophisticated. Not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. Yeah, so there, there's a two-minute explanation for Trump and Sanders. Really, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. I'm dead serious about that. You know, because the right wing, the working class right wing, they think they've been absolutely screwed over, and they have. And then, you know, the left thinks, well, there's way too much power concentrated at the top, and that distribution would be the answer. The problem is, is that, and this is the real problem, it's not that easy to figure out how to distribute the money. Like, first of all, there's a natural proclivity, you might say. You can map, model it with laws of physics. There's a natural proclivity of money to rank, rank itself out like that. And so that happens in every culture. Now, you, maybe you can modify the steepness, but it's not easy to figure out how. You know, and there's a bunch of problems, because there's a bunch of problems that are associated with the more dim-witted solutions. For example, lots of people think that poverty is caused by lack of money. And that's a, really not a very sophisticated theory because there's lots of things that cause poverty. Low IQ causes poverty. And I'm not saying that all poor people have low IQ because that would be stupid. But obviously, if you have an IQ of 80 and you can barely read, the probability that you're going to end up poor is pretty damn high. right? So, so you've got that. And you know it's about 10% of the population who has an IQ of less than 80. That's a lot of people. And so they're not literate. So you think about what they can do. They can't run computers, generally speaking. Okay. Well, then there's people who are ill. You know, there's a lot of them. Then there's people who are alone, and that's a big problem because they're one step away from disaster, right, if you're alone. Then there's people who have alcohol and drug problems and people with screwed up families, and, you know, you can go on and on to add up the reasons that people fall off the edge of the world. And money won't scratch the surface for many of those problems. For addiction, for example, now maybe spending on programs that would remediate addiction would be useful, but if you're an addict and you get money, that's not a good thing. Because all that means is that you're going to just run out the addiction until you run out of money. And so, you've got to have a more sophisticated idea of what constitutes poverty before you can properly address it. And then you also have to take into account that a lot of what's driving people crazy, say in places like the US, isn't the fact that there's absolute poverty, because there's abs actually not that much absolute poverty in the US. So if you take the bottom 5% of the U.S. population, by world standards, they're doing just fine. So, but by American standards, they're doing terribly. And so you have the relative poverty problem. And relative po poverty drives aggression. And so that's something that's really worth knowing. And, and this is something that the conservatives just haven't seemed to figure out as far as I can tell. Because the conservatives might say, well, you should let the money pile up on the right-hand side because, you know, the system is fair and smart, people deserve to be rewarded, and so on and so forth. The problem is, is that as that curve increases in height, the probability that the surrounding society is going to become violent starts to ratchet up tremendously. And you see this in places like Central America, where if you have money, you have to live in a bubble, because if you don't, people will kidnap you. 